and hello everyone uh, who's going to be watching this later. Um, I'm Eric Antwerker. Uh, I am an assistant professor in the Department of Otolaryngology at Next Surgery at Loyola University Medical Center in Chicago. Uh, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about the principles of effective studying, sort of a little background on me. Uh, after finishing medical training, uh, I'm actually pediatric otolaryngology. I did my fellowship in Boston. After my fellowship, I uh, completed a master's in medical education. And so medical education and teaching and studying have been a really strong motivator for me and a very uh, large area of interest. So that's why I figured we'd get a break from some clinical stuff to sort of talk about effective studying. Um, I do want to acknowledge the uh, Corona Initiative in Otolaryngology and the University of Kentucky Department of Otolaryngology HNS for uh, organizing this. This is a fantastic uh, resource for, uh, for all of our residents across the United States. Um, I do uh, have some um, educational technology companies that I work with. None of them have anything to do with this talk. Um, I do like to make this as interactive as possible. I feel like uh, people get more out of this if they're actually uh, having a discussion and there's a lot of experts in the room um, who can also add some of their expertise and I think it's really important to, to have a discussion. I, I obviously don't call, call anybody um, and uh, no question is a stupid question and as always no touching of the hair and face, um, especially during Corona. So uh, during my presentations, I actually encourage you to um, come off mute so you can talk and participate either in the chat or the Q&A, um, unless you're whistling or have music on in the background that's going to be uh, uh, distracting. So um, following this, I really want to make sure that people understand some of the cognitive science behind studying. I think when you understand why um, things work, uh, you are better able to uh, make a plan for yourself and uh, really try to understand some of the principles and the uh, concepts behind why uh, we do the things we do. I want you to define some of the best strategies for learning, uh, both clinically and boards material. We'll talk a little bit about that. And at the, at the end, I really want people to be able to look at their own study habits and really try to take some of this to heart and try to change some of the future habits that, that you guys have. I do have some interactive polling. Um, so I, with a small group like this, I think probably um, we'll just use the chat function instead. I think one of the things I really want to get, to get out of this is I want to make sure that at least the people here um, get the most out of this uh, that they can. So I want to make sure through the chat or the Q&A or even um, out loud, you guys tell me any of the things that you're trying to get out of this talk. What are the things that you guys think um, you should learn about uh, effective studying? Some of the trials and tribulations that you all have. All right. Well, uh, so a lot of people often talk to me about, um, you know, how best to study for boards, how best to study for in-service, uh, you know, how to determine what you should be watching and what you should be doing. And these are all really important questions that we're going to talk about. So the first thing that we, we always talk about is the stages of competence. As people get um, through their training, one of the things that we realize is early on when you're a novice, you really don't know what you don't know. And that is a very daunting thing when you first come into any new domain, whether it be otolaryngology in general, whether it be sinus surgery, or for a lot of early trainees, otology is always a, a black box that nobody really understands. And the problem is, is that you really don't know what you don't know. And so it's really hard to figure out where to start. You then get into this awareness stage where you, you know what you don't know, but you still don't know it. You really need to focus on it. And that is a, um, a very effective strategy for you to try and figure out what you need to know and what you need to study. The next is knowing what you know. And then at the expert stage, you don't know what you know. You have this innate uh, tacit knowledge that you have that it, you don't realize you have it until you're asked to call upon and you're like, oh, I, I exactly know what is the most common uh, bacteria in uh, otitis media. I didn't even know I knew that. So these are the kinds of things that we want people to go through as they go through their training from novice to expert. And um, David Perkins introduces this uh, concept called fragile knowledge. And I want people to avoid uh, falling into this trap. And uh, part of it is uh, obviously the competence. You don't know what you don't know. There's also inert knowledge that you sort of keep on your shelf and you don't really use it until you have to use it. 
And the one thing I want you to avoid is, is naive knowledge or superficial knowledge. And that's really sort of the surface uh, information about a certain domain. And when you're actually challenged to access that information or use that information, it's not readily available and it's hard for you to transfer context or transfer from you know, the book to actual clinical practice. There's also ritual knowledge. Uh, I think that a lot of people will, will know some of this stuff and, and we're not gonna labor it. One of the things I, I actually ask a lot of our trainees, especially if they're having issues, um, is, what, is uh, what do you think is the best study strategy? And um, you know, with a small group right now, I'm not gonna belabor this, but in, in general, um, highlighting is actually one of the worst things you can do. But there's still a large percentage of people, and I'm sure there's people who are gonna watch this talk that do fall into the, uh, the tendency to want to highlight in notes and books. Um, they'll also underline things, which is also not very effective. One of the things that a lot of people do that's not very effective is rereading your notes or rereading your textbooks, and we'll talk about why that is. And surprisingly, flashcards are actually relatively uh, are relatively effective as well as rewriting your notes and we'll talk about why. One of the things and I that's why I really believe strongly that uh, lectures should be discussions is that uh, when you sit and listen to something or watch something it's very passive. When you're passively learning you aren't actually challenge yourself as to whether you're understanding what people are saying. When you have active learning process you're actually taking that information internalizing making sense out of it and then trying to deliver some kind of product. That whether, whether that's a written product or a spoken product or a surgery or whatever have you, active learning is just a much more effective measure of learning. And, and the reason why is because you have this tremendous ability to retain knowledge when you have to manipulate it and apply it. And that is really what is the core of education, what I think the future of education is moving more towards active learning, which is why you see schools moving to problem based learning, team based learning, all these simulation and everything because they realize that having active learning processes and experiential learning is really important for knowledge retention and skill attainment. And this is where it goes to Confucius to say, I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, and I do and I understand. The more you manipulate information, the better and deeper understanding you'll have of that information. The problem with naive learners and the people who don't know what they don't know is sometimes they fall into the overconfidence or overestimation of knowledge and skill. Oh, I know that, I don't need to study it. I, I don't need to look at that. And then when you're actually challenged, all of a sudden you don't do very well on the test or you don't do very well on practice questions. And that's because you overestimated, but you never really challenge yourself to actually see if you had that knowledge. The other is that they tend to understudy. So um, we're actually going to talk about a little bit of both understudy and you can't overstudy. And that's going to what, what I want people to be aware of. And really what it comes down to when I meet with residents who are struggling, it's they've never uh, generated effective learning strategies and they've relied a lot on their uh, ability to take tests, a lot on their ability to do rote memorization, uh, but that doesn't lead to lifelong learning. And one of the biggest differences between medical school and residency is in residency you are going to put all of the things that you learn into practice and you need to attain a lifelong learning process that works for you and this is where you actually form those, those tendencies and that knowledge. The other is uh, naive learners procrastinate. What ends up happening is, is you end up memorizing the week before you are able to take the test and then five days later you forget everything you studied and then the next year comes around you have to do it again. And so this is why I really think uh, developing really good habits early on can actually help you so that you don't have to restudy it the following year. You can actually just uh, test yourself to make sure that you know it. The other is, is, and I see this a lot, is there's a lot of uh, what we call an external locus of causality. And what that means is you blame external factors. The test wasn't right. It asked it weird. Nobody ever taught me that. I don't know why I'm supposed to know this. All of these things that external to yourself that you start blaming. And really what you need to start realizing is it, it sometimes is the situation and sometimes the context and external factors. Sometimes you have to look internal and see what is going wrong and what is not working. And the big thing that you learn from going from medical school to residency is 
this is not medical school. It may look like it and this, the material looks familiar and the style of learning looks familiar, but really it's different. And there's two reasons. Uh, there's one major reason why. And one is, is in residency, we have boards knowledge and we have clinical knowledge. Sometimes they match up in a Venn diagram, sometimes they don't. Sometimes for boards or for in-service questions, you have to remember stuff that you're never gonna clinically apply. Things like sometimes basic science, uh, certain principles. But the fact that you have to learn double the amount of information, not quite double, but a lot more information and have two different contexts makes it a lot more difficult. And you, you have to spin your wheels to figure out what goes where. So what, how we're going to talk about this is we're going to talk about the what, why, where, who, and how. Uh, first, the, the what. So when you don't know what you don't know, there's an entire corpus of information that you have to navigate. And a lot of residencies, I've seen this uh, several times where they say, you know what, if you read Cummings or you read Bailey's twice through your residency, you'll learn everything you need to know. I strongly push back on that. And I know this is going to be controversial, but I don't think that is the most effective way of studying. And I don't think that's the most effective way for residents to be able to get their didactic information. I think there's a lot of things in Cummings that are minutia. There's a lot of things in Bailey's, a lot of other resources where things are either explained not the best way or way too in depth or not in depth enough. And because of those things, you need to actually match a resource to what the topic is. What I do think a lot of these books are really good for is there are some chapters, there are some pages that are really good. The other thing that I think about this and review materials is the table of contents. Maybe the most important thing that you can look at in these, in these books. This is uh, Cummings is I think about almost 3,600 pages. And so that is just a lot of people, uh, a lot for people to read that they may or may not remember. And we'll talk about why, how, why you don't remember it. But one of the things you can look at is the topics that they discuss. You know that these are gonna be the topics that are gonna be important to your specialty. And so one of the things you can do is you can actually organize your studying around these topics. There's a lot of review materials that also have a very good table of context. I know a lot of people use PASHA, a lot of people use case studies, all these other materials. The actual table of contents is a good way to start to organize your thoughts, or you can actually organize by subspecialty, you know, head, neck, facial plastics, otology. I know a lot of people do that. The next is, is to figure out um, what are the top 10 concepts or knowledge points within each area. So let's say head and neck surgery, uh, you want to talk about melanoma. You know that melanoma is going to be an important topic, both clinically and on the boards and on in-service. So you know that melanoma is one topic you should focus on. Well, why don't you list you know, some of the top 10 things within each specialty that you need to know. You know that you're gonna to need to know salivary gland tumors. You know you're gonna need to know deep space, uh, neck space anatomy. You know that you're gonna need all these different things. And so just list a top 10 under each subspecialty, head, neck, facial plastics, and that'll start to give you a nice breadth of what you need to know, what you need to focus on. And how you generate those top 10, we'll talk about it. But um, the most important thing is to really organize yourself and then drill down on those top 10 concepts. Once you have a very good understanding of those top 10 in each subspecialty, then you can actually drill deeper into more, more uh, other topics. Um, so one example is, is, you know, pediatric emergencies might be one topic. So I know that I'm going to need to know the workup of Strider. I need to know what epileptitis is. I need to know what croup is and when uh, otolaryngologists get involved in croup all these different things, and that's how you organize your thoughts. One of the other things that I find residents do is they don't know what not to study. And I know this is gonna be very controversial, but for me, there are definite things that are not worth your time. The amount of time invested and the outcomes that you get, whether you do scores on the points or whether uh, on the test, or it's actually uh, not applicably clinically, it's just not worth your time. There's so much more important stuff to focus on. And I find that residents, especially when they're told to read Cummings or Bailey's cover to cover, they're, they're studying all this stuff. They're, they read 100 pages of stuff that they're never going to use, that they don't need, and that isn't going to be very highly applicable to clinical practice or on the boards. But they don't know what they don't what they don't need to study and this is a very very important step it is a massive waste of time to study that stuff when there's much more important stuff to study so how do you identify your sources so you know there's books there's journals and uh, everybody's favorite is is uh, tv that's where i get all my information if you don't know scrubs maybe you do know gray's anatomy which is probably within its uh, i think 500 season or something now 
Um, so if you actually look up how many sources there are in otolaryngology, if you just do an uh, Amazon search, you're going to get 6,700 results. This is books. This is, um, you know, uh, uh, short clinical uh, study guides. Uh, this is a lot of material. There's zero chance you will ever read all of these sources. The other problem that we have is that the knowledge doubling time is actually 73 days. In 1950, it was 50 years. That means the entire corpus of medical knowledge is doubling every 50 years. Now in 2020, it is 73 days. It is impossible to keep up to date by just reading books. The fact of the matter is the amount of time it takes from the chapter of a book to written to the time it's published, it's already out of date. And the book itself is out of date by the time it's being published because it doesn't include all the available information. And that's going to be a really important concept. So for conceptual understanding, it's really good to go to books. But if you're trying to keep up to date on the most up-to-date recommendations, um, today we had grand rounds talking about uh, anticoagulation in the setting of deep neck space infections and Lemire's. You're not going to get that information from books because that, that stuff is too out of date already. So let's go to PubMed. So let's say that we want to read all the journal articles. Well, if you look at PubMed and you put in Olerengology, you're going to get 125,000 articles. It is impossible to read 125,000 articles. And what ends up happening is, is actually when you go to the internet to try and find your sources, it's like drinking from a hydrant. Uh, if you try to stay up to date with the COVID content, I promise you there's like 100 articles that get published on the regular. It is impossible to keep up. So how do you identify what sources? The other is, is that you have to determine what you need to know. And you need to know to what depth you need to know. And for me, I think it's really important to start at the conceptual level, start at the 30,000 foot level. This is why when you're studying and trying to figure out what you need to know, I say start with your broad categories. You want to start high up to figure out how to organize information. One of the faults that I see people do is that they get very bogged down in the details and the minutia. The problem is, is that when you get nuggets of information that are free floating in your brain and you don't have a place to store that information and other information to connect it to, your long term memory doesn't uh, reward that knowledge and it doesn't access that knowledge and so it's really hard to remember. So what I always organize is uh, create a conceptual map of everything you need to know. One example I give is when I'm teaching uh, students or residents how to know uh, the causes of uh, hearing loss in children, I don't start talking about all the individual causes. What I do is I start with mapping out the space, create an overarching organizational principle so that when you get Javel Lang Nielsen and you read about it, you have some place to put it, a bookshelf in your brain to put it. And that's really, really important because now when you need to access that information or you have a, get another nugget of information to put on that same shelf, all of a sudden those get connected. Uh, mnemonics can help, and we'll talk a little bit more about mnemonics. Once you get the organizational structure, you get the concept down. Why does conductive hearing loss, um, res what, what is the pathophysiology of conductive hearing loss? Then you can actually drill down and say, okay, why does uh, Apert syndrome have conductive hearing loss? Why does Treacher Collins? All these other things, but you have to have the conceptual understanding. Another good example is otosclerosis. Um, otosclerosis, once you understand what's happening, you can actually understand and drill down in some of the details. And I really, really always encourage residents to move from the what to the how and why. One of the things is the most annoying thing when we were toddlers is we always asked why. I encourage my residents to ask me why all the time. And why is a question of trying to understand what's going on. What is a memorization strategy? How and why is because you are trying to get a deeper understanding of what's going on. Why does otosclerosis cause this? Why, what is, you know, why does the third window phenomenon happen? Once you drill down and understand the why, then you'll have a deeper understanding and you'll be able to use that information in, an, in a, uh, a cogent way. The other is when, you know, residents are doing uh, cases with me, uh, I always tell them why I do things a certain way. And one of the things that I always get pained to hear is when people say, that's just how it's done, or that's just how I was taught. That is a very dangerous position to be in because then that information lives on an island and it can't connect to other things because you don't have a conceptual understanding or deeper understanding of why things are the way they are. The test, the question I always get is this going to be on the test. And this is where residency is much different than medical school because I think a lot of the clinical 
uh, pearls are sometimes different from what's going to be on the boards or in service. A lot of people here in lectures, oh, uh, you need to know this for the boards, but don't worry about it for clinical practice, or this is the answer on the boards, this is what we do clinically. And the fact of the matter that they're different sometimes is actually very painful, and it goes down to my problem with current uh, methods of assessment, uh, which is a whole another talk. But the why is actually drilling down and giving you why do I need to know this? And it's important for whoever is teaching you to tell you why, because that why is a deeper understanding. And I encourage you guys to always ask your uh, mentors and your teachers, why does this happen? And can you explain it to me? And we talked about the bookshelves and concepts early. You want to build the shelves within novice learners so that they have some place to store that information. Um, otherwise, they can't connect it to anything and they don't understand why. And then they just say, it's probably aliens. The details come later. So um, this is actually a picture from Challenger D. Uh, so you want to understand the details later. Once you have a conceptual high level of understanding, then you can actually drill down into each of the topics of your top 10. The problem with memorization and mnemonics. So memorization um, is very short lived, uh, as you guys all know. And when you are put certain co conceptual understanding into mnemonics and memorization, it connects it to the mnemonic only and it doesn't give you that deeper understanding. And that information then lives on an island stranded uh, in your brain. And when information is stranded, there's not a lot of pathways to get to that information, which makes it harder for you to access it when you need to. And mnemonics can work. I, I do not uh, totally slam mnemonics, but I think sometimes what ends up happening is people remember the mnemonic, but they don't remember what it stood for or what it was for or why they used it. And that's because it's not connected to anything else except for the mnemonic. We used to have one for the cranial nerves and where they exited the skull base. Those were uh, total, <laughs> I remember the mnemonic, but I can't always remember what the actual foramen were and what, the, what it was. So really be careful with mnemonics and memorization. Memorization, I, always, often refer, uh, I often refer residents, if it's the information where I say, don't focus on this, if you want to get some extra points on the boards, that's information that you save for memorization because it's going to be rote memorization. You're going to get a couple extra points and then you can forget it until the next year. That's the stuff that doesn't need conceptual understanding. It doesn't need any clinical uh, practice, but it's just one of those necessary evils that are on the test. Those are the things you want to try to memorize in the weeks before. And when you actually memorize, again, you have information that's in your brain that you don't even know how or why you're going to use it. And I don't think that's a useful use of your time. And the reason why you forget after memorization is because the forgetfulness curve is about uh, almost 90% at six days. So if you try to study something, uh, study within the last six days if you want to use that information. Otherwise, you start forgetting it. You can actually take advantage of this, and uh, there's actually a forgetfulness curve when you do have some more conceptual understanding. I actually recommend revisiting certain topics every six weeks, and we'll talk about that. This is, um, this is the reason why short-term memory goes to medium-term memory to long-term memory. The more connections that there are between that information and other information within your brain, whether it be prior or new knowledge, um, makes it easier and there's more pathways to access that information. And this is why conceptual understanding is important because you start to connect very disparate things of, oh, I learned this here and I learned this here. Oh, but here's the connection. Now both of those pieces of information are stronger within your brain because now you have multiple pathways to it. And creating multiple pathways within your brain will give you the biggest access to the most information. And so that's why changing context is really important. When you learn it in a book and then you learn it in simulation, then you learn it in clinical practice. Those are three different contexts that you've now connected and created memories within your brain to access that information. When you have multiple pathways, there means when one is blocked, another pathway can be accessed. And uh, this is a picture from the different uh, access ways to Mount Everest. And you can access that through multiple, multiple ways. And that's important. Source control is, is one of the next things I talk to my residents about. Uh, like I said, reading Cummings cover to cover or Bailey's cover to cover or any book cover to cover twice during your residency is not going to be the most effective strategy. I think one of the problems that residents have is they don't understand what source to use, what should be the end all be all source. And the short answer is not the one you want to hear. It's multiple sources. When I think you should uh, be studying for, for clinical practice and for boards, you should use multiple sources. Not one source is going to be sufficient. It is a massive waste of time to read a thousand pages of basic science when you need to learn melanoma staging. 
Um, and this is one example. So how do you do source control? So this is the UK uh, Olaryngology faculty. Your faculty are fantastic for this. When you say, hey, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Gupta, I want to learn the best way to do facial analysis, or what is the best article on open nasoceptor rhinoplasty? And I promise you that it's not going to be, once you go across all the different specialties, head, neck, facial plastics, otology, they're not all going to name the same book. And if they don't name the same book, it means that you can't use that book for all purposes. What you do want to do is to try and identify the best sources that make sense to you. Dr. Gupta may say, you know, this article in, you know, facial plastic surgery is the best article on nasal septal rhinoplasty. So then you use that article to study for nasal septal rhinoplasty. You know what, there's a, there's a chapter in Cummings that really goes over this really well, but really uh, just pages one through 10 is probably all you need to know. Don't read the other 30 pages. Once you start identifying those best sources, you actually collate them. And this is where residencies come in handy. You have multiple people in your residency. You can actually tag team and create a, a best source uh, catalog for information so that not only you, but everybody behind you can have the best resources to read about the most important topics. Laryngomalacia, you know, Dr. Dana Thompson's chapter on laryngomalacia is part of our trial thesis. This is the best chapter on laryngomalacia that you could ever read. Then why read it anywhere else? You should read it in the best source that experts have identified as the hallmark study to look at laryngomalacia. And that's where you can actually work together as a team. You need to mix sources by topic. It may be a book chapter. It may be several pages within a book chapter, not the whole book chapter itself. There may be journal articles. There may be case studies. There may be online resources. There's a bunch of online courses that actually do a lot of good things. These lectures, for example, there may be somebody said, this is the best lecture on the topic I've ever heard. For example, there was an allergy, um, there was an allergy uh, webinar or, or um, recorded lecture uh, that I used for studying for boards. That was the best explanation of allergy I've ever read, I've ever had. So why would I go study anywhere else? That's not efficient. I, why not go to the best resource possible to, to actually try and learn that information? And the best thing you can do is create a master list and share it. The next is, is where to study. So in general, you know, some people study at the library, some people study at cafes, some people study at home. Um, sometimes I do think it's important to mix it up, but the most important thing is to set yourself up for success. Wherever you feel like you are best, um, excuse me, able to focus and retain information, then you use that space. Don't, if you know you're going to be, excuse me, distracted at home with doing laundry and cleaning and doing all kinds of other stuff, then don't study at home. Um, it's really simple, and, and uh, it is important to try and change contact, uh, change settings sometimes um, just to keep your sanity, as we know, <laughs> during COVID. The next question that I get is, uh, should I do a solo or should I do a group study? I think a lot of people sort of got different um, uh, methodologies from medical school as to what worked best for them. I think a lot of people have already identified this, but in general, I think when you're solo, uh, you should focus on making a very deep understanding of what's going on and get the conceptual understanding. When you get the conceptual understanding and you get deep understanding, then you can actually go to the group and actually test yourself. And I think groups are really, really good for testing your knowledge and you challenge each other. You say, hey, what, what you know, um, you know, John, what is the number one, ca uh, number one bacteria of otitis, acute otitis media in children? And if, if John doesn't know that, that, that's obviously something he's identified that he needs to learn. And maybe you can inform him, maybe he can look for it himself, but it's important that in groups you actually challenge each other. And you guys could do this remotely now. You guys can send each other questions every day. You guys can challenge each other. There's actually a lot of services that provide some of these uh, questions that you answer every day to make sure that your knowledge is not fragile. That you don't have that so not deep and focus on conceptual questions, not just fact-based questions. And, and at the end of the day, it, between solo and group, again, set yourself up for success. Whatever you think is going to work best, that is what I think you should do. The next is schedule. So I will, I will be completely honest that I'm, I'm not great at scheduling, uh, but I do know that it's an effective strategy. And one of the things you guys do is to take, okay, today's gonna be an otology day um, and facial plastics day. Tomorrow I'm gonna to do head, neck, and laryngology. Next day I'm gonna do peds in general. So whatever it is, is try to make a schedule and try to stick to it. 
one of the important concepts of making a schedule is something called interleaving. And that basically means that you uh, do uh, otology and then you go and do facial plastics and then you do rhinology and you'll actually interleave between the different topics. And the reason why that's important is if you have a Monday that's all otology and a Tuesday that's all laryngology and you never come back to otology, then your, abil your brain's ability to focus on multiple things at the same time is, is hindered. So remember on boards, it's not organized by specialty and clinical practice isn't always organized by you're only going to see croup today. You're only going to see otosclerosis today. You have to get your mind ready to context switch. And to do that best is to actually interleave. And this actually also activates your knowledge because something that you learned on Monday, if you revisit it on Thursday, all of a sudden you are interrupting that forgetfulness curve. And you can actually make sure that you solidify that knowledge. And I do recommend that you keep coming back to certain topics on a regular basis so that you don't let that stuff lay dormant in your brain. And when you're making a schedule, one of the things you do is you do this interleaving. Blocking is where you do, okay, this week I'm going to do otology. Next week I'm going to do laryngology. I don't want you to do that. I want you to interleave, and you can even split days. This morning, otology. This afternoon, rhinology. It's going to be important for you to context switch to test your brain and, and uh, increase your ability to be able to do that in clinical practice. The next is how to study. So everybody gets a little creative with how they study, and I, I encourage you guys to always do what works for you. I think for me, a lot of doing conceptual understanding and, and really challenging yourself um, is going to be most important. And one of the things that I do recommend is trying to do your hardest or weakest area first. For me, no offense, it was facial plastics was one of the hardest things for me to learn. And so when I was studying for boards and studying for in-service, I started there because I knew that was the area that I didn't know well. I didn't know head and neck well, so I really uh, focused on doing those two. I knew that my pediatrics and my general uh, oryngology knowledge was pretty good, so I, I didn't completely ignore it, but I pushed it off to a little bit later and really focused on the hardest areas first because I knew that was gonna be the biggest bang for your buck. And this is all about efficiency. You wanna be efficient and you wanna be effective, and this is the way to do it. Um, uh, the next thing is, is uh, you know, a lot of people ask, what is the best way to learn from something? And we talked about it before, but highlighting is actually the worst thing you could ever do. One of the things that you can, um, that really makes it most effective is actually writing. And so if you actually write down the concepts in your own brain, it actually increases your ability to retain that information. And the reason why is because you are actively um, taking that knowledge, uh, conceptualizing it in your brain and creating cogent thoughts and putting it on paper. That is extremely important process that you're actually manipulating the data, putting it in your own words, and that is going to lead to more active learning and better retention of that information. If you just read and highlight, you're very, very passive. If you underline, same thing. If you circle, same thing. It's actually still very passive because you're not going through the process of extracting the information, manipulating the information, and outputting the information. That is what learning is. That's the learning art. That's why, you know, we talk about pimping and, you know, I'm not a big believer in pimping, but I am a believer in the Socratic method and the Socratic method challenges you to take information that's in your brain, make a cogent thought and express that thought. That is where you are actually being able to access that information from long-term memory. And that's the way you're going to be long-term uh, remembering that information. The other is, is a lot of people take notes on computers. And I will tell you now that the research shows that if you take notes during a lecture on a computer, it's less effective than writing it down. And a lot of people ask me why. The reason why is because when you're typing on the computer, you end up being a transcriptionist. And instead of actually processing the information, you're able to keep up and actually just transcribe what people are saying without actually processing it. It is a passive pass through. Instead, if you're writing it, you can't possibly write as fast as they're talking. And you are forcing yourself to summarize the information in your own words and writing it down in a method that you'll remember and you'll understand. So you're actually processing the information as, a, as opposed to being a passive pass through. And beware the fallacy of knowing. A lot of people say, oh, I know this, 
But then when they're actually challenged, they don't actually know it. And for me, like for pediatric laryngology, when I was studying for boards, I said, you know what, I think I know this. So what I started doing is I started doing questions to test my knowledge. And I realized that I didn't know what I actually thought I knew. And I had to go back and study those things. You don't want to find that out the week before the exam or the week before you're doing a case. You want to find that out very, very early on so that you can actually focus on those areas. So beware the area where you think you know what you know. The other is, as I talked about this at, at length, is um, be careful of superficial knowledge. If you think you know things, but then when you get asked the question on the test and you get it wrong, you obviously didn't know it to the depth that you needed to know it. And this is actually a hard concept to figure out where you're okay um, with having superficial knowledge and to what depth you actually need your knowledge. And this is where questions come in really, really well. Once you have that conceptual understanding, then you can actually start digging down deeper under the surface and really figuring out um, if you actually know to the depth of knowledge that you know. Um, and actually um, uh, writing these out and writing out questions is a really important process. And another thing that people do, um, this has actually gained a lot of favor in, the, in recent years, is the idea of concept mapping or mind mapping. And I think this is a really good way, again, of creating those shells of creating a, a conceptual understanding of what's going on and understanding that, okay, uh, let's say for chest pain, you know, this could be anything, this could be hearing loss. Um, if you separate into common causes, occasional causes and rare causes, then you can actually start organizing your thoughts when new information comes through. So if you look at rare causes and it's non-cardiac, so now you have this non-cardiac rare causes of chest pain. And when you learn about um, you know, pulmonary inf infarcts, you have a place to put that information and connect it to the greater world that is that, that is that world. And this is why, what I do with my residents when we're learning about hearing loss. We say, okay, there's congenital and acquired. Under congenital, there is genetic and non-genetic. Under genetic, there's syndromic and non-syndromic. So that way, when you learn Javel and Nielsen, you'll know that is a, uh, 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 a genetic congenital cause of, of hearing loss. The role of questions, uh, I talked about this before. I think once you have conceptual and deep understanding, then you can do questions. It doesn't make sense to do questions early on unless you're trying to identify what you don't know. And if you're really confused, like, hey, I, I think I know some otology, but I really don't know, then you start doing questions. But actually trying to learn from the questions, that's not the time to do it. The time to do it early on is to figure out what areas you need to focus on. You know what? I really need to read about otosclerosis. Don't learn about otospongiosis and this and that from the question. Go back to your best resource for what it is to learn otosclerosis. And the best resource is probably asking your co-residents, looking online, or asking your faculty. Those are the people that are going to have access to the best information on otosclerosis. It's not reading the answer to a question at that point. When you use the question later on, when you have a really deep understanding of otosclerosis, you can challenge your knowledge and see if you actually understand it to the depth that you'll need it for in-service or boards or for clinical practice. And I think that it really increases your self-efficacy, your ability and your confidence and your ability to answer questions. And this is actually a strong predictor of performance is your ability to have self-efficacy. If you have self-efficacy, that is the confidence in your ability to perform a task. The more self-confident you are, the better your performance is going to be. Now, again, be aware of the, uh, of the uh, fallacy of knowledge. Um, don't be overconfident. Be confident in what you're able to answer correctly, uh, but don't take that for granted. Do, do keep yourself in check and don't get a big head. Um, and the next is source identification. Some questions, when they have um, answers to those questions, they actually give you articles to read. Those are really good uh, resources to figure out, okay, I answered this question wrong on osclerosis. What article did they use? Um, you know what, they, a lot of people have mentioned that article. Maybe that's a good article to read. And the people who write the questions oftentimes wrote the articles. And so that is a good way to actually identify some sources that you may have not been familiar with before. The other is, again, really try to practice uh, doing questions once you have that conceptual understanding. Unless you challenge yourself, you won't know that you know it, and you won't be able to do that retrieval when it actually comes to the time to do the test. But do it intermittently. So once you feel like you've known otology, on a Monday, you study osclerosis. Okay, on Thursday, try some questions. See if you actually understand it to the depth that you need to do. If not, then go back and revisit osclerosis in the areas where you had the most, the most weakness. Learning happens when the struggle happens. 
I know it's really hard to do all these questions. It's really hard to challenge yourself and self-explain when you're writing actually the concept to yourself. I promise you the difficulty is what learning is. This is why teaching somebody else is actually both one of the hardest things and one of the best things you can ever do, which is why I think in group practice, actually teaching each other is a great strategy. If you have to give a lecture on otosclerosis, you better have a very deep understanding to be able to give that presentation and answer questions from the audience. This is why I encourage, and this is what we did in our residency um, when I was at University of Cincinnati, our didactics were taught by our residents with faculty oversight. And the reason why was because your studying to give a presentation and teach other people was the learning for yourself. It wasn't actually doing the presentation. It was preparing for the presentation that was important. And then forever, you'll remember, I know old sclerosis because I gave this talk and because I actually had to generate and answer questions um, from the audience. The other is to think about thinking. It's really important to think about how you think about things. This is very um, uh, inception, but uh, I think when you understand how you think about things, you can develop best strategies to how best implement those. For me, when I'm about to do a procedure, I actually think about and imagine my mind how that procedure is gonna go. And then I question, okay, why would I do that? What am I thinking here? That, those questions are trying to, again, do that why and do that deep understanding. And the better you understand it, the deeper you understand how you think, the better you're gonna perform and the better you're gonna be able to have long lasting learning. So one of the things I do want you guys to do is uh, you don't have to answer it here or in the chat if you want, uh, but I want you to think about what elements from this are you going to change about your studying? If you're early on, if you're a novice, what are you going to do to try and organize your studying? What are you going to do to try and identify the best sources of information? How are you going to generate that list? How are you going to do the conceptual understanding? When are you going to do questions? How, you know, what questions are you going to do? These are all really important questions that you need to ask yourself so that you can get the most out of this talk. With that, I thank you um, and I appreciate everybody's um, uh, watching this and please feel free to uh, reach out to me. Um, I'll actually uh, provide my email uh, and uh, so uh, I'll take any questions now. Eric, it's me. I have one question. Yes, sir. Um, when you're studying and you have a topic that you struggle with, like for me, it was biochemistry. <laughs> and I didn't need to learn all of the, all of the, uh, you know, sequences, but I needed to understand the concepts to apply to pharmacology. How do you kind of figure that out as you're going through it? In other words, you can spend a lot of time spinning your wheels, learning, as you said, the minutia. So you're usually using that as a basis for something else. Exactly. So how do you figure out how much of a base is a good enough base, especially in a subject that you struggle with? That is a great, great question. And one of the things that you can understand to what depth of knowledge or how am I going to apply this knowledge, uh, questions are actually a really good way to do that. And again, it's how is this information asked or how am I going to use this information? We talk about the, it's called the proximal application of knowledge. How am I going to use this? And uh, that's why, oh, it's on the test is not a good answer. or This is just how it's done is not a good answer because you need to understand how am I going to use this information? And once you understand that, then you can go back and figure out what you need to know. So for example, for biochemistry, you may at, take some pharmacology questions that use the biochemistry as a basis. Why do uh, lidocanes with an, uh, with an I versus is an O, what's the difference? And that's when you're like, okay, well, I need to understand the biochemistry of what's going on, but not to the depth of what are the bonds and how are they breaking. I really need to understand it at a more superficial level. And questions come in really, really well there, doing cases, asking faculty, asking other residents, how do they ask this on the boards or why do I need to know this information? One of the best examples I have, you know, I helped with a course that was done um, in Boston that I helped with. And one of the things that they were doing was they were trying to level set medical students. And one of the things that they did, that they did really, really well, was uh, they took a basic science 
concept and tied it directly to how you're going to use it, even if you didn't, weren't going to use it right away. The example we gave was there was a partial pressures uh, um, lecture or, or section. And in order, instead of just teaching them, oh, this is how oxygen and carbon dioxide are, this is what pressures do, this is how diffusion works, they, they took you to a ventilator unit in the ICU. And the ICU doctor basically talked through how pressure, partial pressures are actually dictating respiratory mechanics and mechanical ventilation, how they're actually applied. And then went back and explained partial pressures to explain why you need to know partial pressures and to what depth you need to understand partial pressures to be able to understand mechanical ventilation. And really good instructors do that. They tell you, this is what you need to know. This is why you need to know it and how you're going to apply it so that you can really do not only source control, but understand the depth of knowledge that's required. That was a great, great question. Any other questions from the audience? If not, you can, anybody can reach me. My email is eric, E-R-I-C dot Gantworker, G-A-N-T. W E R K E R at L U M C dot E D U. Uh, with that, um, I, I give back my time. Uh, I really appreciate everything, Sarah Lynn, and the entire department and the whole Corona initiative. I really appreciate what you guys are doing, and this is fantastic. Thank you so much. That was a great lecture, and I really think that the residents watching it back will get a lot out of it. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Awesome. We appreciate you very much and thank you for being part of this. And of course. Stay safe and healthy and um, thanks again. You as well. Thanks so much, everybody.